Welcome to the CIA Services Associations in Practice series. Today we're going to have a conversation about short-term rentals. Short-term rentals have really exploded over the last decade, really, with the advent of easy-to-use internet sites and apps. Uh, where you can find very easily your ideal vacation spot anywhere around the world. Well, short-term rentals are wonderful, except when they're in a planned community. Sometimes there are problems associated with planned community uh, rentals, such as wild parties, parking, trash, and other issues of that sort. Residents sometimes are concerned with the transient use of the property and strangers all the time coming in uh, to the community coming and going. Associations have dealt with this in a number of ways over the years, trying to enforce parts of their restrictions regarding business use of homes and residential use and things like that. Sometimes these issues have even gone to the courts and there's been litigation over it. The results have been quite mixed where different courts have ruled in different ways. All of that changed in Texas on May 25th when the Texas Supreme Court issued an opinion on this particular topic. That's what we're going to talk about today, what the impact of that opinion is, and in addition, what associations can do. At this point, we have a great panel uh, that's going to have this conversation. I'd like to introduce each of our panel members. The first uh, person is Mia Lorick. Mia is an associate attorney at Roberts, Markell, Weinberg, Butler, and Haley, and she practices in the firm's litigation and appellate divisions. Her practice focuses on several areas, including community association law. Mia received her law degree from the University of Houston Law Center. Also, we have Elliot Capuccio. Elliot's a partner with Pullman, Capuccio, and Pullen, and practices in a wide range of areas, including property and owner association rights. Elliot received his law degree from St. Mary's University right here in San Antonio. And finally we have Brandy Brack. Brandy is a community manager with CIA services and soon to become a stockholder of our company. Brandy manages several communities throughout the greater Houston area and has been providing solutions to her clients for many years. And I'm Ralph Troiano. I'm president of CIA Services, and I'll be serving as the moderator for today's panel. So let's go ahead and start talking. And I'm going to start with you, Brandy. What in the world is this thing called short-term rentals? I don't think I really ever heard about it uh, a dozen years or so ago. So what's up with short-term rentals? Short-term rentals, by definition, is a lease of a property or a home less than 30 days. Um, with the rise of Airbnb, which was launched in 2008, vacation rental by owners and home away, um, online applications that are easy for anyone to use for both a property lease, lease or, or someone who has a property that they would like to lease. Um, they're very convenient to access to just about anyone, so it's become more increasingly prevalent in today's society. Um, we have, we know that short-term leasing exists in most of our communities. It's not until that an issue arises is that we become involved as a management company. Well, it sounds like uh, just from the popularity, um, I view short-term rentals and probably I, I have as uh, well. All of us have. <laughs> yes. Um, that they're a really nice alternative for families uh, for vacations for businesses, for business travel, and those sort of things. But when it's in a planned community, what sort of experience have you as a community manager had uh, relative to short-term rentals in communities? Um, examples in the San Antonio area, as indicated um, by the map that we'll be showing, um, our communities are indicated with stars. They are central locations for many amenities, attractions, shopping in the San Antonio area. So when you have close proximity to great shopping, um, attractions like SeaWorld, Fiesta Texas, Splashtown, and the Riverwalk, which is very, very, you know, busy attraction here in San Antonio, with almost 26 million visitors to San Antonio each year, the vacation rental homes are easy access that provide a more homey feel for 
rather than using a hotel or a resort. They have the at-home amenities and they're close proximity to a lot of our area attractions. Additionally, here in San Antonio, what we've seen is we have a lot of colleges and universities with over 12 colleges and universities in our area as well as the Air Force bases. We have a lot of visitors from out of town that are coming for graduations, for commencements at the Air Force. So it's easier to have that home feel and stay. But with that home feel, people are comfortable. So they have home things that happen like lots of parking. Everyone in the family would be bringing their vehicles. Um, there have been incidences where homes have been advertised as party locations, specifically in one of our large scale communities in Houston. We had a home that was advertised as a bachelor and bachelorette party location. Um, so we all know the things that could possibly happen with a bachelor or a bachelorette party and most of us wouldn't want that happening right next door. Um, another example that we have here locally between San Antonio and Houston is we have a lake community where a home that was rented out as a short-term lease became a party house for teen and college students. For that community, their specific issues were the noise, the parking, alcohol being used, lewd acts kind of happening throughout the neighborho neighborhood when alcohol was involved. And additionally for this community, it was a concern of drowning because they were on a lake community on the water. So that was a huge concern for that community. Um, we've also seen examples near airports where homes have been offered for flight attendants and pilots for sleepovers and stayovers. Um, but it's not until there's an actual issue that we can know that they're involved, that they're in our communities. We know they're there, we just, they're not on our radar until it's an issue. And that's an important point is that um, there are so many of these going on, and we'll touch on this a little bit later, that we don't know about because it, in many cases it's just a pure residential use, a family staying in there so that they can go to the Alamo mm -hmm. or to go to a, a, a Texans game or something like that. Uh, but at some point things may get out of hand you mentioned the bachelorette parties, you mentioned the, uh, the lake parties that were going on. Um, and when that happens, we need to uh, attempt to correct the problem. We turn to the attorneys at that point. And so, um, Mia, what kind of things have you seen that have occurred in, and when did you first start getting wind that these things were happening? We as a law firm first started hearing about these probably beginning in 2012 was really when the activity started picking up and so the first cases probably surfaced in 2014. The reason that we became aware of it is because oftentimes when you have these types of rentals uh, the neighbors complain and the neighbors complain to their board of directors for their community association and when the neighbors start complaining and demanding that the association do something usually a board member or president of the board will give us a call and say we're getting a lot of complaints about the partying and the trash and the noise going on can you take a look at our restrictions and let us know if this is permitted use one example we had was there was a home uh, on the outskirts of houston but it was being rented through airbnb and they had a no firearms or no shooting off fireworks or guns or anything like that because of the cattle that was in the community and so the airbnb they weren't privy to those restrictions. And so you were getting these bachelor parties and bachelorette parties where people were shooting off fireworks and firing guns and essentially ruining hunting season. And so we became aware of that problem. And then another one actually was a bachelorette party where a group of, of 20 women arrived and they had access to a gated community and the gated pool and amenities. And so then us lawyers get a call. <laughs> And, and that's where we always turn to when there's a difficult situation. And, and Elliot, uh, so once you get a call, what, what are the traditional ways that attorneys have tried to address this? What's, what are you hanging your hat on in the restrictions? Sure. Well, typically in Texas, you're going to start with what we refer to as a 209 demand letter. And that refers to Chapter 209 of the Property Code. 
And that gives homeowners certain rights, and they're entitled to notice of the alleged violation. They're entitled to an opportunity to cure if it's a curable type of violation. Uh, they can even request a hearing before the board of directors to try and address it. So the, the first thing that would typically happen is the management company would send out a 209 notice before it gets escalated to an attorney's office, and, and hopefully it resolves. If it doesn't, and if the board needs to escalate it to my office, we would send another 209 type notice to the owner and try to engage in a dialogue and, and hopefully try and resolve it without resorting to litigation. If we reach a point where there's just no middle ground and we can't settle the issue, then the board has a decision to make and that's whether or not they want to invest the money and time in filing a lawsuit, which is what ultimately led to the Timberwood Park dispute that, that went up on appeal. Um, but even when you get to a lawsuit, in Texas, very often most cases settle before it ever gets to a trial or an appeal. Um, not just homeowner cases, but, but all disputes. I think the last time I checked, about 89 to 90 percent of disputes will settle before it ever gets to a trial. So often the lawsuit is really uh, a means to an end to try and escalate things, get some attention, and really bring the owners to the table. And then what will often happen in Bear County, uh, you have to go to mediation before you go to trial. And so very often we see these cases settle at mediation where there's a third party neutral who sits down at the table and tries to work out a compromise that both parties can live with. Very good. And, and what would be a typical compromise? Would the association say, okay, we give up? Or would the owner say, okay, we give up? Usually not so much like that. Right. Um, for the last couple of years, while the Timberwood Park case has been up on appeal, there's been a lot of uncertainty. And so oftentimes when something has come up, uh, we've reached a compromise where we get an agreement to at least respect and follow the other uh, covenants in the neighborhood. So for example, we're talking about fireworks. We're talking about parking, okay? Um, just because the issue of whether or not you can lease or rent a home for a short period of time has been in dispute, it doesn't mean that the people leasing it and the owners who are ultimately responsible for their guests don't have to comply with those declarations. They certainly do. So we typically try to focus on the underlying declarations that are being violated by the owner's guests. Okay. And up until this point, Elliot, there actually have been a number of uh, cases that did go to trial and in some cases appeal and and what were those messages uh, were, was the association always winning was the homeowner always winning yeah uh, it was split and that's really one of the reasons I think Mia could probably talk to why the Texas Supreme Court decided to take the case because we had some courts of appeals going one way some going another and that's where the Texas Supreme Court typically steps in to resolve that exactly and so what, uh, what we found is that we had mixed messages. Uh, associations and attorneys weren't really sure what, uh, what their abilities were. You'd certainly hesitate to invest the money in going to court with that level of mixed uh, information. And so uh, our world of associations in Texas kind of changed on May 25th, 2018, when uh, Mia, went uh, in front of the Texas Supreme Court in the Tar versus Timberwood Park case. And by the way, with something interesting about that case, the association didn't bring that case. That they was where Mr. Tar sued the association to get a de declaratory judgment Correct. to say it's okay what he's doing. Mm -hmm. So that was a little unusual in yes. that case. So went to the Supreme Court, and before you get into the details, if you could, what's it like going in front of the Supreme Court? It is so intimidating. <laughs> you, uh, as a practitioner, you're in there and you get 20 minutes per side for oral argument, if they even grant oral argument. Mm -hmm. So first you submit your briefing on the merits, and then if they grant oral argument, you have 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And you go up there and you're standing at a podium and there's a huge mic in your face and you, you look up and there's nine chairs kind of eight feet higher than you. Um, and, and you're so close to the chairs that you have to swivel your head to see all of the justices. Uh, and there's a green dot that starts at 20 minutes. And then as the clock is counting down, it changes to yellow when you have two minutes left. And then red means out of time, get out of there, done. Finish your sentence? No you're done. So you want to allow in that last two minutes that you're wrapping it up, everything else. 
the only way you would get to finish your sentence is if a, if a justice asks you a question uh, when you're out of time and you can ask if you are permitted to answer. Um, but very intimidating, you're getting rapid fire questions from all of the justices on hot, contentious issues. So you have to be extremely prepared. You don't know what they're gonna ask you. And again, you only have 20 minutes. Wow. Um, thank you for going through that. <laughs> Are and, you nervous? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, so that we could get clarification yeah. in Texas under the law. So what is the opinion? What did they come up with? Is it a narrowly uh, based opinion about this community specifically or does it apply throughout Texas? Both. Um, I, this opinion is narrow with regard to the short-term rental issue and the restrictive covenant at issue in Timberwood Park, but I do think the court makes some holdings that are very widespread and far-reaching. Uh, for example, the court comments on the fact that there's no construction that allows you to read in restrictions, and so if a restriction is not expressly prohibited in the restrictive covenants, that judges should not be inclined or allowed to read in those restrictions. And this goes on a notice sort of argument that when owners buy in a community, they should be on notice of what's allowed and what's prohibited. And so if they're looking at the governing documents for the community with at the title company before they close, and it expressly says that you cannot lease your home for periods of shorter than 30 days, then that puts somebody on notice. Okay, maybe I don't want this property I was thinking of doing Airbnb rentals, this may not be the house for me. But if the restrictions are silent as to that and say residential purposes, the Texas Supreme Court told us that that's not enough to get you there. And so I do think as far as that holding's concerned, it's far reaching because we're gonna see this come into play with other restrictive covenants, not just short-term rentals. And along that specific line, isn't there a section of the Texas Property Code adopted by the, uh, the legislative branch of government which says that uh, restrictions shall be liberally construed for their intent and purpose. Absolutely. So in 1987, uh, the Texas legislature passed House Bill 356, which is now codified in Section 202.003A of the Texas Property Code. This section reads, all restrictive covenants shall be liberally construed to give effect to their purposes and intent. And if you look at how it applies, it says it applies to all restrictive covenants, no matter when they were created. So it's retroactive application. But what we saw the intermediate courts grapple with is how to reconcile the Texas Property Code, liberal construction, with what courts have always followed, which was strict construction. So up until 1987 and even after, due to the split, uh, courts resolved all doubt in favor of free, unrestricted use of land. That if there was any doubt as to the meaning of a covenant, we go in favor of free use. So you would almost always find in favor of the homeowner, free use. Uh, the Texas Property Code says liberal construction. So when we were arguing this case, we said, because these two are in direct conflict, meaning liberal versus strict, complete polar opposites, that the statute trumps, that we no longer should look to the common law, we should look to the statute. But the reason there was a circuit split, uh, you had Austin and Fort Worth on one side and you had San Antonio, Beaumont and Houston on the other side, was because the courts were picking different standards to apply. One court may go with liberal construction, meaning that they probably are going to find in favor of the homeowners association, and the other courts were going with strict construction, meaning it was resolving doubt in favor of free use of land. So we had this very interesting circuit split, and we thought that when the Texas Supreme Court took Tar versus Timberwood Park, that the circuit split would be resolved. Uh, but the court, after very thorough analysis, declined to resolve the split and said instead, in this particular case, it doesn't matter which standard you apply because there's no construction, no matter how liberal you try to construct this, that allows you to read in a restriction. Okay. So we got an opinion that isn't necessarily clear as to the impact in any association. Correct, and I think the implications of this may be far-reaching and unknown for several years. Well, with that said, there's always hope that uh, we can take some messages away from this. So, uh, 
Elliot, you know, you've read the opinion yes. uh, from the court, uh, 27 pages of uh, a very detailed uh, analysis that the court provided. Is there something that we can take away from this? If, if, if a developer is writing brand new restrictions, is there something they could put in? If an association has the ability to amend their documents, is there something uh, that they could put in that would help? What are your thoughts? Yes, that's a great question, Ralph. And I think there is. There are several things they could do. And, and keep in mind that, that prior to the TAR decision, I think we often argued that CCNRs, the declaration, was like a living document. Because keep in mind, when many of these associations were created, there was no such thing as VRBO. It just didn't exist. There may not even been an internet at the time some of these associations were created. Um, so you necessarily had to read into some things because we're constantly evolving as time goes on and the same with developing neighborhoods and associations. Um, but my reading of the Texas Supreme Court's decision is you need to be specific. And so if you are a developer or if you're a board that's getting ready to take over control from a developer so that it's easier for you to amend your CCNRs, um, you want to put in specific prohibitions. And then the question becomes, well, what do we want to prohibit? And how specific and how strict do we want to be? When I have clients that deal with questions like that, my suggestion is typically to have the board form a committee and get some input from other owners and neighbors in the community. Um, because again, do you want to try to prohibit them outright? Or do you want to limit it to certain times of the year, certain times of the week, certain lengths? There's any number of options you have available. So I think um, one thing boards might want to consider is form a committee and get some input from the neighbors so they can come up with something that's acceptable to everybody. Um, and it's real important to do that either at the initial development stage or when the boards are getting ready to take over control from the developer. Because as you know, once the developer is out, it becomes much more difficult to amend the CCNRs. And in most cases, you're going to need a super majority a vote of the owners at 67 percent, which is very difficult to achieve. Absolutely. And along those lines, um, forming a committee, getting a consensus is important. Uh, for example, we have one community still under developer control, um, a, a beautiful master plan community, and that developer has specifically made the decision that they do not want to put a prohibition into their documents that they could do with just their signature today. Um, and so the same uh, issue may come up among homeowners that they get together and say, you know, we want to have this ability. We want to control it, but we want this ability. Uh, we have a couple of communities where uh, vacation rentals is actually built into the document. It's, an, uh, it's part of the, the benefit of owning in that community. So Brandy, you know, one of the uh, things Elliot just brought up is amending documents. The vast majority of communities that exist in Texas are not under developer control right now. Uh, and so if we need to, if there's a desire to amend the documents, how does that work? Uh, how easy is it? Well, the CCNRs will have a, a limit that the association needs to meet. As, as Elliot said, that 67% is the highest the limit may be. It may be extremely difficult for a community to get 67% of the members to sign a document agreeing to a change in a rule. Um, the reason it, you know, it can be so hard is that vacation rental next door might not affect the entire association. So having every owner or 67% of the owners in a large association agree that a rule needs to be changed can be very difficult because it might only affect one block or one cul-de-sac at this time. So, it's very important that overall, as a management company, and when we're talking to our communities about amending documents, that, that we recommend that they take up issues that affect the entire community. Um, so at times, vacation rentals might not affect everyone in the community, um, but we do have the ability with guidelines to place some restrictions on short-term rentals within the association. Well, let's pick up on that in, in just a couple minutes. Uh, to me, I'm hearing that if you're concerned with short-term rentals in a community, things are a little bit bleak because the Supreme Court is a ruling that um, has indicated that 
in general, unless there's specific language otherwise, they're okay. And our choice is to amend our own documents, which is not easy. It's very difficult, absolutely. So we have a situation where we may not be able to outright prohibit, mm -hmm. as some associations maybe had wanted or tried. So who can come to our rescue? Elliot, uh, are the cities, counties, state coming to our rescue? That's unlikely. And while the cities and municipalities are looking into it, it's primarily for licensing and taxing purposes, not so much for the uh, prohibition or anything like that. So I, I wouldn't count on that. I think it, for boards, if it's unlikely that you're going to be able to amend your governing documents, you need to start looking at what the underlying behavior is that you're trying to prevent that might be exacerbated because of the short-term rentals and then focus on setting up rules and regulations like Brandy mentioned to try to deal with that behavior. So municipalities, but we have a lot of communities who are in the county. So is the county going to do anything? Unlikely. <laughs> okay, so not the cities, not the county. How about the state? The state, of course, is going to do something. Uh, I wouldn't bet on that, Ralph. Okay. <laughs> because? Well, so look at it this way. The, the industry is booming. VRBO, Airbnb, it generates a lot of money. And they are paying lobbyists, and they're working up at all the different state capitals. Uh, it's very unlikely that you're going to see a grassroots movement come and combat uh, all of the lobbying efforts that you're seeing the industry throw at this. Okay, so they're here to stay. Uh, I, th I bet on that. And all of us are currently using it and will continue to use it. Okay, so uh, back to you, Brandy. Specifically, why are we concerned about this? You mentioned a few at the beginning. Just tick off a list of what what causes real problems? It, it's mainly, it's not the lease itself, the short-term lease, it, lease itself. It's, it's the symptoms because of the short-term lease, the music, the parking, you know, parties, you know, discharging of fireworks, firearms, you know, concerns about transients coming in and out of the association, um, especially if it's a gated association, private community. Um, they're, they're now having access to codes and amenities that most property owners feel belong to them as a private community. Um, so it's not specifically the lease time frame that tends to be the issue with associations. It's the actual symptoms of the short-term lease that affect the association that they would like to try and restrict. You know, one of the ones you just mentioned regarding gated communities one of our examples was where um, gated communities generally have a gate code that all the owners get that you type it in and the gates open. Uh, this particular advertisement had the gate code yes. in the, uh, the site's advertisement for this property. So literally the whole world, including you know, folks in Belarus, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, could get into that community with the gate code. So there are real symptoms and real problems that are associated with it. Um, you know, one of the things I'd like to uh, kind of delve into is um, what we might be able to do about the symptoms. Mia, you know, could we create, for example, some guidelines, uh, some communication, some expectations as to what we expect from these owners? Absolutely. Uh, guidelines, different rules or policies that kind of give owners guidance on what's expected of their tenants if they do choose to enter into these types of leases. Uh, putting something into the guidelines or rules about, you know, fireworks being prohibited or reminding the owner to remind their tenants of certain restrictions. Because you have to remember when tenants are coming in for their Airbnb rental, they're not getting a copy of the declaration with all the restrictions. So communities can be proactive about providing rules or policies with regard to leasing. Now, with the caveat of the Texas Supreme Court did tell us that enforceability of restrictive covenants is limited to what's in the actual covenant. We have not seen a policy guideline or rule go up to the Texas Supreme Court for judicial scrutiny. And so in making this, you, you need to be wary and be 
extremely specific. I do think that some evidence of intent of the community is better than no evidence. At least there would be something in front of the court to say, okay, here is the intent of the community. Here's what the community is saying they want. But we have not seen that stand up yet in court. One nice thing about creating guidelines, something in writing, is it's a means of communication as mm -hmm. to what our expectations are. And a nice thing about potentially creating guidelines is that these guidelines have nothing at all to do with short-term rentals. Mm -hmm. They have to do with all owners. So all owners, please don't shoot off fireworks. Mm -hmm. All owners, please deal with parking issues. All owners, please make sure trash isn't put out on Tuesday when trash pickup was on Monday and your next tenant is until two weeks from now. Um, so doing it that way, if we're rooting it in the existing CCNRs, applying it to all, then we're simply creating a document that we can insist or at least request that uh, short-term rental owners provide to tenants. Mm -hmm. Maybe they just laminate it and put it on the refrigerator. Something like that where we're uh, describing expectations. Elliot, if we do that, is that something that we would then be able to enforce if it really is routed in the restrictions and we have an owner who's a flagrant, the tenants are flagrant violators of this? It's certainly helpful and it absolutely puts the association in a better position. One of the things that all board members want to be certain of is that they are not acting in, in the way that lawyers and judges refer to as arbitrary or capricious. As a director, you want to act uniformly and fairly across the board, make sure that you're treating all the owners the same. So by coming up with community-wide guidelines that are applicable to everyone, not just those who are engaging in VRBO or Airbnb, um, you increase your chances there. Um, the thing that I would suggest is once you pass those guidelines or when you're contemplating the guidelines, um, to think about how you're going to enforce them and how you're going to prove a violation. And this is where things get really difficult in the CCR enforcement world because there is always by nature a level of subjectivity to it as opposed to say an assessment collection case where you either paid or didn't pay. Here if we're talking about a noise violation, well what might be reasonable to one person might not be reasonable to another. Uh, maybe you want to specify like most municipalities do where they have decibel readings now so that there is at least some objective uh, standard to hold it up to. Um, and then make sure that you're gathering evidence, okay? Oftentimes I see boards that maybe a disgruntled owner comes in and complains about the neighbor or a tenant of the neighbor doing something and wants the board to take some action, but that neighbor doesn't have any real evidence. No, uh, the phrase, a picture speaks a thousand words, right? Well, it really does in CCR violation cases. If you have some photographic or video evidence or recording evidence, that helps. If it's just one neighbor's word against another, those are very difficult to win. And it's also, it also creates difficulties for the board because now you're relying on that one owner to prove up the violation. And what happens if that owner leaves? moves out of the neighborhood or just doesn't want to come testify. These cases can take a while. Like mm -hmm. with the Timberwood Park case, I think it took four years yeah, or so. Years. So you want to make sure that you've got some evidence that will be there when and if you do get your day in court. One of the challenges for um, prosecuting a short-term rental issue if we're prosecuting it based on activities that are occurring, you know, these, these problem issues, is this. That owner may have 50 different renters who come in during that one period of time. And two of them may be having big parties. So we have two data points and 48 data points saying they're being a conscientious homeowner. And so that could certainly uh, enter into it. And, and one last legal question, Elliot, is kind of related to that. If we decide to proceed under any basis, whether we have a, amendments which prohibit it or, um, or guidelines that that's, are very specific about problem areas. What happens when, Brandy just indicated we have these short-term rentals all over all of our neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. We only know about the ones that are problems. What happens when that owner 
who really is allowing problems to occur at their property, comes to us and says, you're picking on me. Here is a list of 25 other places in the community who are running these sites in our community that we never see. How do we deal with that issue of you're picking on me? Great question. So that's typically referred to in courts often as a selective enforcement defense. Uh, where one defendant owner says that the board is singling them out and you heard me mention before that as a board you don't want to act arbitrarily you want to act uniformly and so if a uh, owner that gets sued claims that there are other instances of similar conduct that's not being pursued that can be a fairly compelling defense um, and so as a board you want to be certain that you are enforcing these policies across the board if you know of them now again if you don't know of it you can't be charged with any responsibility to do anything. It has to be at least capable of being observed, okay? But if it gets brought to your attention, uh, by all means, I've consulted with clients and someone brings this up and we say, thank you very much for bringing this to my attention. We will go ahead and send out 209 notices to these other owners. We want to be fair and treat everyone the same. And uh, thank you for bringing it to our attention. That's one way to deal with it. Um, where you could run into some issues are if you get to violations that get outside of the limitation period and everyone should be aware that in Texas uh, the limitation period for a CCR enforcement action is typically going to be four years. Now that can be extended if you can show that it wasn't capable of being discovered uh, then you can stretch it out some. But if you have a violation that was open and obvious and you knew about it for more than four years that owner could assert that affirmative defense of limitations and you might be barred from pursuing that. So it's real important that boards know if you become aware of these items and violations, um, set some reminders. Make sure that you don't let that limitation period pass without doing something. Very important. Let me ask a, um, a follow-up on that particular one and that is, I believe I heard you say that an association is not necessarily obligated to seek out these non-obvious ones. There are um, online services which will uh, track short-term rentals. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a brand new uh, company that's all around the United States that for a fee they will tell you all the short-term rentals that are happening in your zip code, in your community, or whatever it else is out there. So certainly these are discoverable. You never know by driving by the house uh, in many cases. Is an association, since that is available, obligated in any way to be either using a service like that or to try to, uh, to find these? I would argue no and that the association, the board of directors, is not the police force for the neighborhood. And they're not under any extra special duty to go out and investigate or research issues like that. Um, it really becomes an issue where you have complaints that get brought to the board or get brought to management and, and they either ignore it or, or fail to act. That's where I see it becoming more of an issue. Terrific. That, that really adds some clarity because there are some uh, who feel that we need to search out everything that may be out there. One of my favorite examples of that is from many, many years ago. It was a community that CIA Services first contract uh, 34 years ago. Uh, there was something in the CCNRs that I always scratch my head about and it says that every home shall have a working garbage disposal. And, and the question was, you know, what obligation do we have <laughs> to investigate and, and so I'm glad you <laughs> answered that we never had that we never had that obligation because we we didn't try to exercise it right. okay well we've we've covered all the um, important aspects of it relative to associations and what to try to give board members uh, some guidance and managers some guidance what I'd like to do is is just kind of have a uh, final thoughts. Brandy, what, what do you think here? Short term rentals aren't going anywhere. I mean, as, as you said, you know, our own association, management companies, managers, attorneys, we're all using them. They're extremely convenient. Um, and, and it gives that homey feel a lot of times that we're all looking for when we're out of town. So 
as a manager, I would say that they're here to stay. We, we, we can't say that, that they're going to go away anytime soon. Um, but we can place limitations on the symptoms that cause concerns within our community by using guidelines um, and affecting rules that effectively you know, restrict the symptoms. Maybe not so much the business itself because, you know, as the courts decided, that the business of the short-term rental itself is not the issue. It's the symptoms. So that's where, as a manager, I, I keep my focus is let's, let's take care of the symptoms rather than going after the short-term rental itself. And Elliot, what are your thoughts? Uh, so carrying on from Brandy's comment, as the litigator who gets these cases when everybody's ready to throw their hands up in the air and say, you take care of it, and I'm happy to do that, it comes down to evidence. When I go into court, I can't simply say that Mr. Smith told me he saw a violation on X date. I need evidence. And so pictures, video, audio, whatever the case may be, uh, as, much as, as much as can possibly be gathered. If you're going to take pictures, make sure they have date stamps. Uh, if you're going to have video, make sure it has date stamps. Uh, if it's an audio recording, make sure there's somebody there that can prove it up, okay? But, but as much evidence as possible to come into these hearings and, and as well to be able to show the court that we've made every effort possible to resolve this before resorting to litigation. Mm -hmm. And I tell all my clients, litigation should be a last resort. It takes longer than you expect. It costs more than you expect, unfortunately, as we've seen from the Timberwood Park case. Um, so really be able to show the court that we've given them an opportunity to cure. Um, we've tried to work something out. We've tried to be reasonable, and they've refused. And so here we are, and we're asking for the court to intervene, and here's the evidence we have to prove it up. That makes things a lot easier and cheaper for the association when they have their day in court. So we have what we do to prevent going from the attorneys. We have what happens when we do go to the attorneys. And Mia, when the attorneys <laughs> happen, you're our go-to to the Supreme Court at this point. So what is your sage advice? My sage advice is that even though we have this 27-page opinion um, that appears to say short-term rentals are allowed all over Texas, the court was very particular in saying on a different set of restrictions, this may have come out differently. If the language was a little bit different here, if we didn't have this word there, this may come out differently. And so if a community is really wanting to ban short-term rentals, reach out to an attorney, have the attorney review your restrictive covenants, because it may be that you have enough in your restrictive covenants to still enforce them. Um, and so while this opinion is probably the most detailed we've seen in community association law in decades, and it is very far-reaching. Uh, they do make a conscious effort to make some holdings very narrow and specific to Tar versus Timberwood Park. Well, we've reached the end of our conversation. Brandy, Elliot, Mia, thank you very much. Hopefully what we've done here is shed some light on this whole short-term rental issue relative to community associations. Um, we hopefully now understand that there are limits as to what associations can do, and truly there are limits as to what an association should be doing uh, relative to this. This is uh, a residential use, a little bit different than, than most, but it is something that uh, many, many people are interested in taking advantage of. One of the things we discussed here are the possibility of putting together guidelines to uh, regulate as, as much as we can the symptoms, the problems that can occur. Uh, if you're interested, you can contact our company and we've got some elements that you may want to put in those guidelines. We, we put that together, so just let us know and we'll send it to you. Thanks for joining our Associations in Practice series from CIA Services. Mm -hmm.